The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good morning. Welcome to our webinar today. This is Jeremy Hinek from Isograph. I also have <clears throat> Joe Belland on the line. Joe's head of our technical support and training in North America. I do uh, business development and uh, a few other things. Today we're going to be talking about linking fault trees to the two event trees. Um, it's a little gem in the software that <clears throat> not always people always use, but the people that do really like it. Uh, if you are already a fault tree plus user, the event trees is included with your fault tree software. You, it includes fault tree, event tree, Markov, and Weibull analysis. Um, I don't want to take too much time, and I'd rather pass this over to Joe, who's our technical expert on these things. Just a few uh, quick notes. You'll notice on the GoToMeeting software when you started the web meeting, a, a pop-up appeared on the right-hand side of the screen. You'll notice, or you might not notice, everybody in the meeting today has been muted. Uh, there's quite a lot of attendees. Um, so it makes it hard to field questions uh, if we don't have everybody muted. So in the dialog, you'll see a little section called questions. And in that, in that question dialog, you can um, ask any question that you would like, and it'll send it to me. And I, I usually answer those questions during the web meeting. If I don't, we answer them after. And for, for questions that are um, of interest to everybody, we usually pause during the web meeting to ask questions. So please use that if you'd like. Um, Joe, do you let me um, let me pass controls over to you, Joe, and you can take over. Sure thing. Hey, you should have that now, Joe. Yeah. Okay, so uh, I've shared my screen, so you should all be able to see uh, the PowerPoint slide. Um, as Jeremy mentioned, we'll be talking about event trees today. Um, primarily, how do you link them with uh, fault trees? But I'll also talk about event trees a little bit, just on their own, give a little bit of a background in case you're unfamiliar with the concept. We'll and I'll we'll show how they relate to fault trees, how they link to each other, and, and uh, what the difference is. So in order to understand the difference between fault trees and event trees, it helps to understand the difference between deductive and inductive system analyses, system analysis methods. So for an inductive uh, system analysis method, it has to do with inductive reasoning. Inductive reasoning is the uh, basically where you start with a specific, um, you know, a specific uh, event or, or consequence or a hazard and work your way to some general conclusion. In, you might think of the scientific method as an inductive reasoning. You start with um, specific observances and work your way towards general rules. With uh, hazard analysis, uh, you start with a specific hazard or failure mode or something that's going on with the system and reason your way to general, what are the general possible what are the effects of that outcome. So that would be, that's uh, sort of the event tree analysis way of looking at things. You start with a hazard and then ask yourself, okay, what are the outcomes? What are the possible consequences following that hazard? Contrast this with a deductive analysis method. Deductive reasoning is sort of the opposite, where you start with a, uh, a general um, observance and work your way to specific causes. Um, in hazard analysis, or in, in uh, failure analysis, that's, that means that you start with your hazard your general hazard or, or failure mode of the system, and then work your way backwards to individual specific causes that could, co that could create that hazardous condition. And that relates to fault tree analysis, in which uh, you start with a, what's called the top event or the, uh, you know, the system event in the fault tree, and work your way uh, backwards to figure out the individual failure modes of components, or, you know, individual components or uh, subsystems that could lead to that hazardous occurrence. 
so you can see, I think you might be able to see uh, from here how these two are related to each other. They're both um, starting from a hazard. Fault trees work backwards to figure out the causes of the hazard. And event trees work forward to figure out the outcomes of the hazard. So yeah, so I think you can see that those can very easily be linked to each other. And you might very well be using a fault tree to quantify the hazard that uh, serves to, as the basis for your event tree analysis. Sometimes in this context, they're called bow tie events, where the hazard is a uh, uh, represents. Um, it's, if you draw the the trees, the diagrams next to each other, it kind of looks like a, a bow tie, where you have the the uh, a, a wide range of fault tree causes narrowed down to uh, a specific hazard, which then expands to various possible outcomes from that. So just to go more into uh, into event tree analysis, so as we've mentioned, it's an inductive analysis method. So what we're trying to do is identify the outcome of an, what we call an initiating event. That's that hazard that I mentioned. We start with that um, assumption, that specific occurrence, that, uh, that hazard, and then say, okay, assuming that that hazard has occurred, what are the possible outcomes of that initiating event? As we've seen, it's closely, relinked to, closely linked and related to fault trees for a couple of different ways. As I mentioned, the fault tree can be used to quantify <clears throat> that initiating event in the, in the event tree. And also, they use similar quantitative cut set methodology. What that refers to is the specific calculation uh, methods used in the fault tree are the same ones used in the event tree. Basically, cut sets refer to the, uh, the, the uh, combination of events, event occurrences that would cause a particular hazard. In a fault tree, we would um, have a way of, of calculating cut sets for the top event and using um, mathematical laws to quantify those cut sets. In an event tree, we quantify in a very similar way the possible outcomes, the consequences of the event tree. Before we jump into uh, actually looking at considering event tree examples, um, let me just briefly explain what the event tree diagram will look like. Well, it'll make more sense when we see it's an actual example, but we'll just get started with a, a simple explanation. So the you might be familiar with fault trees, which are read top down. You have your top event, so-called, because it's at the top of the tree and goes down. Event trees are kind of on the side. You start in a, you read it left to right. So your initiating event will be the leftmost column in the event tree, and we'll read it left to right fashion. So the the um, first column represents that initiating event, and the subsequent columns are enabling events. And the enabling events are things that could, uh, or you know, component events, system status events that could influence the possible outcome based on the, uh, the behavior of these other systems. They could lead us to one consequence or another. Um, so we call those the enabling events, and those are the uh, subsequent columns following the initiating event. The final column in the event tree is the consequences. What are the what are the possible consequences of the initiating event given the status of the enabling events? In each column, we have branches representing, uh, generally speaking, the success or the failure of the of an event. So if, uh, if a particular enabling event represents the um, uh, operational status of a particular protection system, the uh, branches in that column would represent whether or not that uh, uh, protection system is working or not, the success or failure of that system. In certain cases, in more complex event trees, we might have non-binary, what we call a partial failure. What that means is basically rather than just simply two branches, successful failure, we can branch it to three or more, representing um, maybe degrees of failure or um, basically it allows us to take into account different degrees of exposure or um, um, success. So you could say that's 100% um, successful or um, or could represent capacity uh, values as well. Basically it um, allows us for more of a greater range of outcomes. Okay. Clear as mud, right, just from an explanation. Well, let's take a look at the an actual example of, of an event tree. That might help us understand it in a little bit uh, more detail. Yeah. 
So I have the Reliability Workbench uh, software open to the Event Tree module. You can see from the module selector up in the upper left that I've selected the Event Tree, which in the uh, list of modules appears right below the Fault Tree. As Jeremy mentioned, the Event Tree is uh, part of the Fault Tree um, package. So if you purchase the Fault Tree uh, module, it also comes with Event Tree as well. This particular example, this one's kind of going back to isographs roots. This is actually an example of entry from the nuclear industry. So isograph actually, uh, our corporate directors come from the uh, nuclear industry, so that's kind of our background. But our initiating event, and then right in the leftmost column is, is the initiator, this represents the uh, a pipe break, a cooling pipe breaks in a nuclear reactor. We want to know what are the possible outcomes following that um, hazard initiating hazard. There's a few different things that could happen. Uh, enabling events that could influence the possible outcomes. One is if we have electric power. Electric power is, is uh, if there's still electric power when the pipe break occurs, that can lead us to different consequences. We also have an emergency cooling system. If the main coolant uh, pipe breaks, then we have another emergency cooling system which can come online and help out. Uh, we'll also uh, when the pipe breaks, we'll start the procedure to, to um, shut down the reactor, basically, to remove the uh, fission product. Um, and if we can do that, that will influence the outcome. And lastly is whether or not containment integrity is maintained. Um, if the pipe break occurs, but we're able to contain it such that none of the, uh, um, no material is spilled or, you know, or leaks, that can also lead to different outcomes. So based on the status of each one of these um, enabling events, you notice in each column we have branches representing the success or failure of these different um, enabling events. Based on that, that will lead us to um, some end consequences, which here we've defined in terms of um, the size of the, of the release of radioactive material. Let me set some options uh, to make this a little easier to read. Firstly, I'm going to turn on the branch types. Right now, the branches aren't labeled. We can turn on the branch labels by uh, setting the branch type. The branch type, so we can see success and failure branches. This will help us read it a little bit more easily. So the way we'd read this is, if the pipe breaks, that's the assumption, starting assumption. Pipe breaks. Um, if we have electric power. But we are unable, or, but the emergency cooling system fails. We do remove the fission product. That will lead to a small release. The null branch means at this point, this um, event, this enabling event, has no impact based on the, what's come before it. It doesn't matter what happens with the containment integrity. It has no impact on the system. So we put a null branch there. On the failure side of this, you'll see we have success and failures here because the containment integrity still has the possibility of influencing the outcome. Um, another uh, brand possible outcome would be if the pipe breaks, we have no electric power, no emergency cooling. Notice that there is no success branch. There's a reason for that. That's because the emergency cooling system is actually dependent upon electric power. These are um, dependent upon each other, so there's no way for the emergency cooling system to work unless there's electric power. So we've deleted that uh, impossible sequence. So electric power, no emergency cooling. We uh, uh, do not remove the fission product, but we do maintain um, containment integrity that leads to a large release of toxic of, uh, radioactive material. Okay. Let's see. So Part of this uh, web demo, we want to talk about linking the fault tree to the event tree. And that has to do with these enabling columns. Each one of these columns, the initiator and then the enablers, are quantified via a fault tree. We can either apply a basic event directly to the column, or we can match a uh, fault tree gate, basically a fault tree itself, can be linked to these columns. And that, what that means is the failure and success branches in that column are based on the failure or success of the fault tree. So let's take a look at that. If I double click on this one, this is basic events. If the electric power system 
based on a fault tree gate. So I can see that if I jump over into my fault tree. Here's the fault tree that I've built. We can take a look at the, the different branches of that. Here's the fault tree we've built in order to quantify the uh, um, that enabling column, the electric power enabling column in the event tree. Again, we can do that for every, we can do it for the initiating column. We haven't in this particular example, but it, it can be done. That's where we run into what we call that bow tie event, where the fault tree is quantifying the initiating hazard of the event tree. Um, and I think we've also done it for the emergency cooling. The, the cooling system is also a, a fault tree used to quantify this column. Okay. Lastly, the end of it is um, the consequences. If you've used the fault tree software before but never touched the event tree, you'll probably have noticed this consequences uh, node in your project hierarchy on the left. And you're wondering, where does that ever come in? It has to do with event trees. This is where we define the final consequences. The program that supports up to 10 different consequence categories. This is a uh, purely safety related, but you can also track things like financial or environmental consequences as well. You can define an arbitrary number of consequences and assign one consequence from each category to a final branch in your event trees. Okay. So here we've defined a, a, a range of possible consequences and assign them as appropriate. I should uh, take a break at this point. Um, before, we, before I continue and show the uh, results of this event tree, um, are there any questions that you need me to answer, uh, Jeremy? Uh, no, I think we're good for now. Okay. Okay. So let's take a look at um, uh, the results uh, for this fault tree. So again, when I run the analysis, what the program will be doing is it will be quantifying these branches, uh, again, based on either the basic event that's attached to it or the uh, fault tree gates. By the way, you can either select those from here, you can assign them directly from here, or you can also drag and drop. You can grab a fault tree and drag and drop it onto a uh, column in your event tree. I don't want to do that because I don't want to my event tree. It's already configured the way I want it to be. But So each branch can be quantified from the fault tree gate or event. The final consequences are basically, a, um, the cut sets are basically calculated by applying and logic at each branch. So large, or the very large releases, if this occurs, and this, and that, and that, and that. So imagine them all underneath a single and gate. It's basically logically equivalent. Um, if I built a fault tree for this very large release, that was my top event, and then I put each one of these events underneath an and gate, that would be the equivalent fault tree to this very large release consequence in my event tree. I can do a similar thing for, say, the very small release. Put these events underneath uh, not gates, since um, or for the success, or rather, the success branch is not a failure. So um, you, can, you can imagine putting, for instance, the emergency cooling fault tree underneath a not gate, leading into a, a top gate, which is the AND gate. Again, that's equivalent. So again, that's one of the ways that fault trees and event trees overlap, is since they're using the same calculation methods. Technically, it is possible. Um, anything that can be modeled in a, an event tree, you could build multiple fault trees to model each one of those consequences. The reason you don't do that is the event tree is usually easier to read. And it's a little, it's a more logical layout for evaluating consequences. It's kind of awkward to have multiple different fault trees, one for each possible consequence. Um, event trees are just naturally suited to that sort of thing. Okay, so let's run the results and see what we uh, get. Uh, before I do that, let me make sure I have my project options set the way I want. Didn't, um, let me check these options. Uh, maybe I can explain that these are a little more uh, advanced options, so I don't want to get into too much uh, detail. Just set these options, other options that I want. Modularization has to do with um, solving branches independently. Um, generally speaking, um, certain types of analyses uh, analysis assume that your um, your uh, uh, enabling events should be independent. 
Um, technically, that's not always going to be the case, and the firm doesn't require that. Um, for instance, I mentioned the electric power and emergency cooling are not independent of each other. So I want to um, set the options so that the program recognizes that they are uh, dependent and applies the calculations correctly. That's why I've unchecked these two options here. Allows the program to see that they are uh, uh, that they're not independent and adjust the calculations accordingly. Okay, so I've set those options and then I can run the analysis. The results are seen in the same dialog where you view your fault tree results. So if you've used the fault tree module and build a fault tree, you always go to the results summary when you're done to look up your fault tree results. And here's how you normally do it: you select your gates. You look at your results, you can view your importance and your pet sets, you know, what you normally do. To view the event tree results, there's a couple of ways. Well, one, you'll notice the frequency column on the left-hand side tells you how often a particular uh, consequence occurs. This is kind of like the displayed value underneath the gate in your fault tree. To see the more detailed results, you go to the results summary, of course. And we can view those results on a per-consequence basis. So I can take any of my consequences from my event tree, like a very large release, figure out what its, its frequency is, um, or any of the others. This is useful for instance the, the large release with the one release. You'll notice I have the uh, two branches that end in a, in a large release, so this will be a, a cumulative uh, value for them. So I can see each consequence individually, or I can go by risk category. So basically, I can see for all of my safety consequences what my risk level is. This is another useful advantage to event trees. They can be used to quantify risk. Uh, risk, basically, um, risk is a way of putting a real-world value to um, how bad something is. Sometimes uh, you might be wondering, so we have a really bad outcome. It doesn't happen very often, versus a not so bad but you know not so good outcome that happens more frequently. You might wonder which of those is the the higher risk. And that this event trees can quantify the risk. And the way risk is calculated is the frequency, how often does it occur, times the weight, how bad is it. So that weight value that's defined for the consequence. Each consequence you assign a weight value to. That weight value can be um, whatever scale you want it to be. It could be something like the number of fatalities that could occur, mean the financial loss. It could refer to the number of tons of toxic material released in the event of a failure. Whatever you need that weight to be. Suppose just for example, that in this case, the weight refers to the number of fatalities. The point risk, you take the frequency, and multiply by the weight, and the point risk would then tell you the number of fatalities per unit of time. In this particular example, I think our time units are in years, so we would say that this would represent 1.997 10 to the negative seventh deaths per um, year. Okay. So that's for each consequence, it gives a point risk, and then it sums up the total point risk. So we can see for the system as a whole, what's the risk of the, of um, this particular consequence, the pipe break uh, failure has a total point risk initially, 9.6333, that's 10 to the negative 6 deaths per year, or about one every 100,000 years or so, or about. Okay. So that's how the, the, how the uh, event tree results look, and of course we can also, uh, just like in the fault tree, since the event tree is using the same quantitative cut set methodology, just how in the fault tree we do cut sets and importance analysis, we can do the same thing on a per consequence or a per risk basis. We can look at the consequence leading to, uh, or the cut sets leading to various different consequences. Here are all sets that would lead to a, uh, to a safety consequence. Just like we could in the fault tree. We can also view the importance. What basic events are the biggest contributors to, to the risk importance? In this case, it's the uh, pump one primary failure, the failure of electric pump one has the highest fossil Weasley importance, meaning it's the most likely, um, um, or excuse me, meaning it has a uh, fossil Weasley number 42.7%, 
means that electric pump one was involved in 42.7% of the um, safety hazards, safety related consequences. So that's where it gives you an idea of what the weak points are in the system. Again, that's also similar to the event tree or to the fault tree analysis. In fault tree analysis, you use importance analysis to figure out which are the biggest contributors to the top gate. In event tree, you can figure, use it to figure the biggest contributor to a consequence or to a particular risk uh, category. Okay. Um, Jeremy, any questions so far? Yeah. Um, when you <clears throat> get a second, I mean, maybe not mm -hmm. now. But uh, it would be interesting to show how easy it is to create an event tree from a fault tree and show how they're linked. Sure, sure, yeah. Okay. Yeah, so as I mentioned, I can actually create a new one uh, within this project. It's actually super easy to create them. Um, I would say easier than the fault tree. Because in the fault tree, you have to add a new event, and then you draw it by clicking the... Uh, and then you add a new top gate, and then you click the add gate date and add event buttons to um, be able to add gates and events to the fault tree. It's easy, even easier in the event tree. There's an add new event tree button, and it will basically draw the event tree for you based on how many columns you want to have. You tell it how many columns, and it starts by assuming a binary, just a failure success at each branch. Can modify it from there, but that's a, a basic event tree. Will be just that. So it automatically drew this event tree for me. Um, so things up with all the failure and success branches. The only other thing that I would need to do is assign the uh, quantify the the, uh, the columns with gates or events, or um, uh, and also add the consequences at the end. To associate the gates or events with the columns, I mentioned you can drag and drop. So I could say, what's the hazard of a, uh, a total loss of cooling, or what's the hazard of a loss of electric power? Or I could break it down to uh, a subgate from my uh, fault tree, or any gate really. If I double click on the column, I can choose to link a gate or an event with the column, and pick from a list, and use the binoculars to search for a particular gate. So say, uh, associate my cooling gate at the beginning of the event tree. Now the, uh, the frequency of that total loss of cooling gate will be used for the frequency of the initiating events in my event tree. And again, I can do the same thing for each subsequent column. Drag and drop the gate or the event. Click and drag a basic event. Such. Um, to the columns to, to link them up. Or again, just double click on it choose it from the uh, drop down. And again, this is not a very meaningful event tree. I'm not assigning these with any uh, pattern to it. But, um, so as you can see, it's actually very simple to use. The linking to the uh, fault tree just merely comes from associating a fault tree gate with the, uh, the column. Okay. Was that what you had in mind, Jeremy? Yeah. Okay. Oh, lastly is the consequences, and again, that's a drag and drop procedure. Just grab a consequence on the left hand side and drag it to the branch at the very end. Or alternatively, you double click on the branch, and just click on the uh, consequences to pick the consequence from each category. Okay. Earlier on, I mentioned um, non binary event trees. You'll notice when I created it, it made it all with success and failure branches. And I think that's the most common event tree where you're looking at the success or failure of various protection systems. But sometimes you'll have um, a greater number of degrees of, degrees of uh, failure that you might consider. Um, this could be something like exposure levels, capacity levels, um, load factors, things like that. Um, all sorts of things that could affect the consequences aside from just a, a simple straight working failed system. So for that, let me open another file. So give me a second to find another file that, that uh, has that in it. Okay. So here's another uh, example of entry that has, you'll notice when I get to the final column, you'll see these uh, three branches. 
one, two, three, rather than just two. This is what I mean when I'm talking about a non-binary or a uh, partial failure um, event tree. So the beginning is like a normal event tree. We have a train fire, which is our initiating event. That's quantified by a fault tree gate. So that's our bow tie event. Um, it was the fault tree used to um, quantify the frequency that a train fire occurs. This, by the way, is um, we're switching gears, to, uh, switching industries here. This is a, um, a railway industry of entry. Another big user of entries, uh, the British Railways was our, one of our major users, or still is, um, uh, for the entry software. So we have a train fire as an initiating event. Whether or not the train is in, in a tunnel can affect the outcome. You can imagine that if the train's in the tunnel, the fire is going to be more deadly because the smoke is going to collect more, it's more likely to kill passengers, it's going to be harder to evacuate um, if it's in the tunnel, things like that. It could theoretically damage the tunnel and cause uh, uh, I don't know, a collapse or something like that. Anyway, that's likely to affect the possible outcome. We also have whether or not the fire is extinguished using the onboard extinguishers. And then uh, whether or not the fire brigade are able to reach the train in time. And these are all binary ones. And the last one, the last consideration, is the passenger exposure. How many passengers are in each train car on average? Is it 0 to 10, which would be uh, lightly populated, 11 to 20, which would be medium, or 21 to 30, you know, a large number of passengers in each train car. And based on that passenger exposure, that would lead to different uh, final consequences. Okay, so the, for the first four columns, we've assigned um, gates and events to quantify it as usual. Quantify with either gates or events. But for the last one, for this binary one, there is no object associated with the column. Rather, it, to model these uh, this partial failure, we associate a gate or an event directly with the branch. So if I double click on a branch, you can see that there's an event, it's the uh, branch type is partial event failure, and there's an event directly associated with that branch. That means that the, to quantify it, the uh, program is using this basic event for the uh, probability of this, of this branch occurring. Okay. Aside from that, it works basically the same. Uh, the, the calculation will be the same. Apply and logic at each branch to get to a particular consequence. Use the same cut sets and uh, um, probability math to calculate the frequency of each cut set. Uh, treat each branch as treating each branch as an and gate. Uh, any questions on on that? Uh, no. Is there anything else you'd like me to, to cover, Jeremy? Oh, I think that's a good overview. Unless sure. anybody there's, has any questions. There's one more thing I can I can display. Actually, uh, there are plots and reports uh, associated with the event tree, as usual, as you'd expect. You use the fault tree plots and reports. Just to to mention, one of the most commonly used event tree plots would be what's called the FN curve. This is actually what's a um, event trees are very often used to calculate. The FN curve is a graphical representation of the frequency of the consequence with its weights. So my x-axis is the weight, the y-axis is the frequency. And these are often used when determining a risk policy. The risk policy is that it usually is downward sloping line on the FN curve. This is uh, often used when in event tree analysis graphically show the, uh, the relationship between the two frequency and weight. Okay, I think that's all I have then. Okay, Joe, jo there is <clears throat> there's an interesting question here. Um, okay. Are the sections in the non-binary required to be independent? And if so, how is independent specified? Okay, so, you know, so are the branches required to be independent? That's, a, that's actually a really good question. Um, the program does not enforce that. Um, you would not need to do that. Uh, however, if you did not make them, the branches here, independent, uh, I'm assuming he's talking about the, each one of these branches being independent from the others. Yeah. Um, if you did not do that, the perm will allow it. 
It would just be kind of weird. Conceptually, that would be a weird event tree, and I don't see it done very often. So it's kind of a user-enforced um, uh, independence or exclusivity, rather, is what we're talking about here, um, ex exclusivity of the branches. And the way it's handled is by the probability of these events. So I have three events here, 0 to 10 passengers, uh, 11 to 20 passengers, and 21 to 30 passengers. And he's using, using local models. So the way it's handled is by the probability that's entered into each one of those. They are using the fixed model, sorry. Here they are, these three rows here, the ones I'm interested in. So if you sum the unavailability, the unavailability is the probability of that um, event occurring. So if you sum it, they sum to one. That's what basically is making them uh, independent, is that there's the sum of the probabilities of those three branches sums to one. Now, that again, the program won't enforce that. You could have them sum to less than one, which would mean there's some there's some um, possibility that you're not considering, and that's fine. Eventries will often not consider particularly or particular um, occurrences if they're not interesting or if they're not relevant to the consequences. They could sum to greater than one, and that would indicate that they're not necessarily mutually exclusive. And again, the program will allow that. It's just kind of weird. <laughs> it's not very frequently done. Although if I thought really long and hard, I could probably come up with an example when you might want to do that. All right, thanks, Joe. <laughs> yeah. Well, thank you for attending. Do you have anything else, Joe? Uh, no, that's all. I've got. That's all. all I have. Just a side note on event trees. Um, maybe six, seven months ago, we did a web demo on how to use an event tree to do a LOPA study, a layer of protection analysis. If anybody wants a copy of that, I have a recorded copy of that webinar as well if you're interested. I know it's mainly probably oil and gas and chemical. But if it's something that you'd like, just send me an email. Otherwise, thank you for attending today's webinar. Um, those of you that asked questions that we didn't get to or uh, need a little more in-depth conversation, I'll be contacting you. Otherwise, thanks, Joe. Oh, thank you. No problem. Thanks. Have a good day. Okay.